Hello and welcome to episode 125 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. On this episode of the podcast, I'm joined by another hugely talented musician, the lady behind the keys, Helen Turner. As a much-loved honorary counsellor for the Style Council, she performed with the band live on multiple tours and TV performances in the UK, Europe, Japan and Down Under, including Glastonbury and Live Aid. You can also hear our many recordings with Paul, Mick, Dee and Steve. We're talking songs such as Walls Come Tumbling Down and The Lodgers, The Home and Abroad and In Concert Albums too. In the early 90s, when Paul needed a keyboard player to join his solo band, we're talking the time of Wildwood and Stanley Road, it was Helen who he called. A masterstroke with so many incredible live performances captured for us to play back now, the likes of Jules Holland, Glastonbury 94, Livewood, and you can also hear her on the albums Wildwood and Stanley Road as well. Helen was one of the first names on my wish list back in 2020, so I'm absolutely delighted to have finally tracked her down for a lovely podcast chat. Let's get into it. Helen Turner, thanks for joining me. You're welcome. I am looking forward to digging into these memories. Oh, be- no. <laughs> But to be fair to you, I can barely remember what I did last week, let alone 40 <laughs> years ago. So, you know. <laughs> 40 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Oh, God. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> the, real, like, oh. the sudden realisation. Like, oh, <laughs> yes, it is, guys. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. <laughs> but let's kick this off with, um, obviously, the Style Council, because you were such a key member of that band. We'll talk about the Weller solo years and all that as well. But am I right in thinking when you first auditioned for the Style Council, it was a, as a guitarist and singer, not a keyboardist? Yes. As I've said before, Paul was very nice about that. <laughs> Very polite. <laughs> what did he say? It's not quite what we're looking for. <laughs> and then he said, hopefully at the end, but you do play piano, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing I went to, I think it was Dennis Mundy's office on Oxford Street. God, it's a long time ago. There were Paul and Mick and... I just remembered I'd learn mixer, and that's what I did. And the next thing, I said, yep, fine, good. Then I didn't hear anything for about three months and wondered what the hell was going on. (laughs) And then uh, there it was, straight into rehearsals and off to Europe. And what had your background as a musician been before that point then? I've mucked around at college and things like that, you know, sort of, and even before college. I was put into a band with Pete Brown, you know, Wrote all the notes for Cream. Oh, right. Wow. Okay. I was in one of his lineups, which was a baptism by fire, especially to a, a rather naive middle class young Yorkshire lass. So I was in a, a couple of things. Right? There was something, there was a bloke called Taff Williams. He was to do with the man band. I mean, we're going back into the, into the olden days here, you know, like mid 70s. And um, anyway, that put me off for the next few years. <laughs> I won't ask why. (laughs) Good old mid-70s. And, you know, so I tried other things like publishing, TV, you know, kind of grad secretarial. But you still had this love of music, this love of playing. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I ended up working at Utopia Studios and was spotted by Jackie Leaven of Doll by Doll. And I was in that for, oh, year, year and a half. It was mad. I mean, that was even worse than the other experiences <laughs> in some ways. I think I got to know Tony Stratton Smith a bit. Introduction by introduction, I got you know introduced to the Stamp Council. And was thing. it Dennis Monday who got you the audition? I'm not really sure. I think they really did need a, a second keyboard player because there was, you know, Quite a lot going on. In fact, Mick told me the other day at Brighton, he said, um, so tell me, Mick, did you give Helen the bits you didn't want to do? <laughs> he told me that. <laughs> Mick, Mick said to me, I, <laughs> I used to give Helen the co- more complicated bits. Oh, I don't think that's true. Certainly there were bits that had to be learned. You know, you couldn't just go, oh, yeah, that's an A and an E and, you know, just busk it, really. The great thing about the Style Council and that era, and right through to Weller's solo, obviously, as well, and, and the music that we know and love today, is so much of it was captured on film. I can't believe how much there is. Yeah. I mean, for years, I kept thinking, oh, 
I must get hold of a record company or somebody, you know, and try and get some CDs, try and get anything. Now YouTube. I mean, I'm seeing things now that I just didn't realise existed. Usually when um, somebody comes around because there are, you know, thousands of well nuts basically, and everyone, you know, people I seem to know. <laughs> Where do you live? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we had a... Uh, there's a Ukraine family living next door and it was just completely bowled over by the Star Council thing. They came around for supper and we spent the next 40 minutes looking at Live Aid and God knows what else. <laughs> but as I say, it's amazing. It's amazing how much stuff was recorded live. You had a lot of kit up there, didn't you, on the stage? Well, I mean, there were, there were two bits to it, really. I was at the back. My little bob brush hairdo at the back on the DX10, and the uh, it wasn't the Moog, it was the other thing the, uh, that we did the bass thing for Long Hot Summer. We, we didn't use it as a sequence, it was a down, 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 down. So you could never guess it. Me and Dave Little would mark it carefully after each concert and say, Right, that's it. <laughs> Next rehearsal. <laughs> no, it's not that. No, no, no. And on it would go. You know, that would take up a good 20 minutes just to get that sound back because it was totally analog. Yeah, I think I had two keyboards, one to do strings and brass when strings and brass weren't there. And the fact is that band from, from day one, actually, of live performance, you all sound so tight. I don't know if that's a mixture of rehearsal, just natural chemistry, but it's a great sound that the Style Council produced live. I think it was. There was a lot of rehearsal. I have to say Paul was meticulous about that. You know, we really did work. And, you know, I mean, to begin with, like any new thing, it was probably good by normal standards, but... I think we could all tell when it got to the point where it kind of enters the bloodstream, you know, and it just, as I say, looking at some of these YouTube things, I can't believe how actually sophisticated a lot of it was. There's a bit where, I think it was in Uncut magazine, I think and, and Mick said this to me as well, where, so obviously you, you come into this, the Style Council, you're an honorary councillor. Yes. That's what you are, right? Yes, I got a wage from John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they give you this lovely badge whenever you appear on any records, it's honorary councillor. And Mick said there was this kind of, I think he talked about it as the golden six. So there was Paul, Mick, D, Steve, you, and Kamel Hines. And when you were all together as a live band, particularly, you know, you play piano, Mick would play Hammond. Or vice versa. Or, but yeah. usually that way around, yeah. Yeah, Kamel on bass. It was just worked. It just sounded it great. It really and did, yeah. It was exciting. It really was. And lots of people on this podcast have talked about the Style Council kind of being like a family. Uh, well, two things, a youth club and a family. <laughs> yeah, I used to call it a licensed school outing every time we went on, on tour. <laughs> it was, I mean, when I think of the first trip to Europe and you know I mean I mean I was one of the older ones you know but there were some really young people in yeah, there. Like, wasn't whitey like 17. I mean, really young you know it was like thinking that the minibar was free I remember a in Switzerland at a hotel you know and it was so there were yeah, it was like, it was like a family actually. I mean, I was probably the latest to join, you know, to get involved, and you know, I definitely felt new girl, etc. But it was a real experience as to how all this worked, you know, not just from the point of view of concerts, touring, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but the way the whole. I hesitate to use the word pop. I mean, it was pop. There's pop and pop, but it, the way it all works, you know, from TD to filming to the role of the record companies and what went into it. Like when we did Wembley Arena, you know, not Live Aid, the other one, wherever we were. The showbiz tour. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, occasionally the B, suddenly loads of string players all over the place and the wonderful brass section, you know, who, who are often there. And then again, it could be a really small combo and if necessary I'd be doing sort of strings and brass on, on the good old DX. That's what's been most fascinating about this podcast, I think, that you've heard I've heard from all the characters, everybody involved from the you know the, the agents organized Martin Hopewell organizing the gigs. Oh to, Martin, yes. Oh 
to Spanner the plugger. I don't know if you know came across Spanner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. The amount of things that have to go into oh yeah yeah to a band. It's not just yeah. you know the four of you, the six of you, whatever on tour. And that's it. It's like and 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 so much of it was being made up as it went along because these things didn't really happen, exist. These venues weren't in play. These processes weren't necessarily in place. You know, that's, I think that's very true. I I think there's a big difference in ten years as to how all this. And when you think about it, I mean, Live Aid probably kicked off. Another. Yeah, the stadium thing wasn't the really a thing. And, so, yeah. and now, now we're here, Heritage Rock. Let's talk about some of these moments um, and some of these highlights from your point of view, from my point of view, in terms of listening as well. So Our Favourite Shop it comes out a lot as people, you know, often people say that's their favourite album. There's the, I've got here the 12-inch of beautiful Mick Talbot on the front cover. Here we are. Oh, no. Of Wars Come Tumbling Down. Yeah. That's it. And there we are, um, Helen Turner, Piano on Walls Come Tumbling Down. I mean, that's such a standout track. You mentioned Live Aid. One of the songs played on Live Aid as well, wasn't it? It's it a was. great, great single. What are your memories of that and, and creating that? Well, all I know is I can't play it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it was so fast. I mean, you know, especially I think because of nerves, although it worked beautifully. I mean, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Well, I know that Paul wanted to uh, do something with a you know slight gospel thing, as I remember, and he also wanted it to be a live ensemble take. Once he got it, we rehearsed at Easy Hire in the middle of winter with a bloody great big industrial blow heater to keep, <laughs> keep the ice off us. Can't remember how long we rehearsed, but we really got it down so that, you know, it was recorded just more or less in one take, as far as I remember. Very little kind of repair work to do, if you like. And then, uh, then, when, it came, <laughs> then when it came to life... Um, we wanted something at the front, so I came up with a da, 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 da. completely mixing up my, you know, my popular modern classical music stuff because it wasn't Polish, but it worked. It worked with varying degrees of success. Sometimes I do a nice rundown, reasonably flawless, and then another time it might be a bit of a crash. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often, but I do remember it was like. Ew. Please let it work. I don't know where we were, but we were somewhere in Europe, I think. Anyway, it's quite a big venue. We were all waiting to go on. And whether it was part of an encore, I don't know. But anyway, we were definitely on stage. So Paul and Mick said, you go on first, Helen. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, you, you start it off, don't you? You go on first. We'll be right behind you. Ah, <laughs> right. <laughs> that old chestnut. So, um... And I went, London, 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 London. Nothing, nobody, not a soul. <laughs> um, and, of course, I, I was playing this piece by ear, and there's, there's only so far I could go with that. So I kind of went, da, 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 da. I think I really was about to kind of fall off the stool and faint, and then suddenly I heard this, da, 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 whitey on drums. <laughs> I'll never forgive them. Absolute sods. <laughs> <laughs> now, you talk about that single as well. This was the video for this. You went to Poland to film the video. We did. As well. It's a Warsaw, right? And it was four days filming out there. Tim Pope, the director, who I met recently, I'm hoping will come on the podcast. Oh, yeah. That's your character. But didn't it rain the entire time? <laughs> it did. It was absolutely miserable. And everything looked as though it needed a coat of paint, which it did, of course. Although people said that if you actually went into people's homes, it was a different matter there. It did rain, and we, we did it in this club. I thought it was quite strange in some ways. It was um, it was hard to tell what the audience was thinking. They looked a bit nonplussed. Uh, uh, and also there was a guy, a young guy, but obviously thought of himself as a little bit of a gangster. He got Levi's on and an American leather jacket, you know, real bag of things. And he was kind of, um, you know, he was strutting around, basically. So we were quite intrigued by him, really. He was the one that had got hold of the the contraband, as it were, and he was kind of letting everyone know that that's who he was, or that's how it seemed anyway. It was a funny one, that. It was interesting. It's just that it could have been Birmingham on a rainy Monday, you know, and it shouldn't say that. I mean, that's just one of the many um, locations abroad that you, you travel around to. Some of these gigs are incredible. I mean, you got to go to Australia, Japan a few times, right? I've still got the boomerang. Hanging on, <laughs> yeah. hanging on the rafter next door from Australia. 
the Down Under. <laughs> and that was just the once they went to uh, they went to Australia, right? Yeah, we've been to Japan before that. Japan trip before that was the one with Culture Club and all that, wasn't it? Where I came down with an all over body rash, so I didn't have the greatest fun. I was confined to my room. Oh no! And I wasn't on stage. They never knew what it was, but anyway, I had all these antibiotics. It was very, very, very hot and humid that time in Japan. I mean, really seriously. You know, you can imagine a, a mild drizzle, about fifty degrees or something. So when we flew to Australia, it was like, oh my god. <laughs> it's a bit cooler And then summer happened there two days later But that was nice Anthony Harty talks about Japan being like Almost like beetle level, level hysteria Oh yeah Oh yeah, you probably heard about the time when They invaded the stage then, wherever it was <laughs> Yes, it was at Osaka That so was that... fun <laughs> Just led by a, a bit of dance A bit of harmless dancing And everybody wanted to join in, right? Yeah, well, D and I used to There'd be a gated off bit you know, at the front of the auditorium. And, um, God, it makes me feel tired thinking about it now. So we used to jump off the stage and go, go and, you know, kind of um, really dance away, you know, for, for about five minutes and then leap, leap back on stage again. <laughs> I'd love to be able to leap. <laughs> and, and carry on. So we did that one night and the fans got, um, this is my recollection anyway. Anyway, the, the, the fans were trying to surge and the security guys basically had, you know, rubber buttons and they were actually whacking people on the head. And so anyway, Paul said something. I can't remember what it is he said, but it was actually like, you've got to remember it was a, it was a real traditional theatre, actually, in the Western sense, with everything going up to the balconies, up to the gods. And it was like watching a human avalanche slowly come down. Eventually, they were all on stage. And I think we, we were playing a rather changing mood. We played for as long as possible and then <laughs> made a break for it. <laughs> so we were kind of barricaded in the dressing room for a bit and banned from playing there, apparently, ever again. Oh, my goodness me. Well, yeah, these, these stories are fabulous. The one thing I was watching the other day, there's the DVD, The Style Council on Film. I don't know if you've seen this or got this. And it's got um, things like show business on there. So I was watching that again, which is just terrific. So that was the Wembley Arena. Wait, oh, so yeah, yeah. Paul's pretty much, I can't remember. If we, uh, there may be bits where he's playing the guitar in that, but he's kind of stepped away from the guitar a lot there are bits where he's singing and it's just him and a microphone and some pretty funky dance moves <laughs> which you yeah. don't see from a Weller solo gig these days <laughs> were they dance steps that you all had to organize you all had to learn or what well i didn't <laughs> i just bopped around on the spot but yeah you don't see Weller dancing so much in the solo years there's not a lot of that no, that's true. Yeah, you're right. No, well, anyway, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's no. a terrific concert. You're right, with that John Mealing orchestrations, you've got mm, oh, yeah, Guy, yeah. Guy Barker and all that. Like, it's terrific. Absolutely amazing, I was isn't just it? thinking that the other day, actually, because it's only a few days since I was playing some of those, and, yeah, the arrangements were fabulous. What are your memories of Red Wedge? Oh, that it was very, very, very cold. <laughs> The Star Council almost became like house band for other yeah, outside communards was, really. and things like that. You know? Yeah, it was probably along with Billy Bragg, the, the one constant. That's definitely so. Did you get involved in the politics? Were, in the, were you interested in the kind of Red Wedge angle and um, not always view on that side of the world? Not as much as some. I mean, I was aware of what, what was going on. I remember going to the House of Commons and everything, but not much. So I'm sorry. I, I was, uh, my um, interest in politics kind of flourished a bit later, really. But now we all are, aren't we? No choice. Obviously, the, at this time in the 80s, the, the pop music video was becoming a big thing as well. Were there any of the promo videos that you had to do? Are you in any of those? I'm trying to remember. Apart from Walls. No, I don't think so. I actually left for a year or two in 86 and then came back in 89 and there was going to be a big tour, but that's when they pulled the plug on. You didn't do that final Royal Album? No, movie. no, I didn't. It, it's funny, actually, because I was listening to some of that stuff, you know, because the way they were going on, you'd think it was doing Brecht in avant-garde or something, <laughs> whereas actually it was really bloody good kind of jazz just found, you know, it was really, um, anyway, no, I did, I can't remember what it was for, but I did, it must have been in summer, I did go to Italy with Paul and the others, and I did do a video promo, but I just can't remember which. 
song okay. it was. And it's interesting because I think that break enables you to pick up part two of this story in a way because, and Steve White said the same thing, where it's like, it's not like Paul's solo career launches with Here's the Style Council and it's kind of the same thing. That new band, the, you know, when he comes back again and you become part of Paul Weller solo, it's not just an extension, a continuation of the Style Council, it's something brand new. I understand that there are um, a few reunions that happen. It's almost like getting the old band back together, but wasn't it for your birthday last year where, where everybody got back together? Was that right in Soho? Yeah, it was actually uh, Steve Stolnick's birthday oh, okay. on the day. But mine was a few days later, I think. I've been talking to you know Steve White and everything, and we just thought, why don't we get together? Just have some Chinese. And so we did, and it was great. It was really great. There was a lot we could have talked about. There was a, a lot of stuff, but it, it, time went very, very quickly. A lot of laughs and um, very good memories. So who are we talking about, Steve? The two Steves, D was was D there? D was there. Um, she hasn't been to one since because she's been recording and stuff and there have been things going on. Yeah, Camille was there. Obviously Mick and me and who else? I think that was it, actually. Yeah. Oh, no, there was Lawrence. Nice. I love this. And it's, and that's what makes it so special as well, because you are the, those relationships that you formed on tour and being part mm. of that band, they still remain to this day, which is really special. I mean, let's talk Paul Weller solo. So obviously you mentioned, you know, the record deal, that record modernism gets rejected by Polydor. He comes back with the Paul Weller movement, but you weren't there from day one of that. That wasn't your band initially, was it? No, no, it was, um, Max Beasley was, and I think Jacko was yeah. in that as well, wasn't he? Obviously Steve White. I think Max went on to total obscurity. <laughs> yeah, we've never heard of him since. I don't know what he's up to now. <laughs> you got the call from Paul uh, or from yeah, John? It was from Paul. Yeah, I think he wanted people he knew and trusted, basically. That's probably what it amounts to. And I guess at that point, it was interesting because he has to start back out and doing, he's doing the, the unis, the polys or whatever, and starting out from a small audience again from a live point of view. Mm. But it's not, it doesn't take long and suddenly headlining Glastonbury. No, it didn't take long. It didn't take long at all. Well, I mean, well, Glastonbury was, was it was 94, wasn't it? Yes, yes. And I think I started with um, 91. So, I mean, it took a bit, but it had already got back to a level well before Glastonbury. And of course, yeah, during that time, as we were talking about later, you know, the, uh, as well as with the arenas, you know, the, the whole uh, festival thing was upping its game as well, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Your introduction of things like V yeah. Festival and, and, I mean, Glastonbury now is like a city bigger than London, I think. It's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> it does not appeal to me at all. Mind you, I can't stand camping, so. <laughs> My wife's the same. She's like, no, we're not doing that. Sense nervous headache. I mean, thank goodness for the BBC coverage because you can watch the whole oh, thing at the, the comfort know, of your home. Here, wasn't it? <laughs> and they've got it really good. Yeah, it's brilliant. Brilliant. I pay my license fee for that alone, I tell you. So there are a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. So one was things like Jules Holland around that time. You know, as a, mm. as a fan, because my discovery of Paul was through the song, Aha, uh-huh, Oh Yeah. And oh, I, yeah. I, I then dug into this back catalogue and, and obviously everything then to come, Wildwood, Sandy Road and all that. But you'd get these wonderful Jules Holland specials. where Yeah, they were great. You do like almost like a whole album of stuff. It's I mean, brilliant. He's, he's been doing those obviously all the time since uh, since I was in it. But I loved doing the Jules Holland. I mean, it was just it was just such a musical atmosphere. Well, obviously because it was a music show, but I think you know it was very conducive. Basically, it was thought everything about it was great. That band was on fire as well. I watched Livewood the other day uh, oh, yeah. ag- again, in just in preparation. And you kind of and I was talking to um, Yolanda Charles recently on the podcast as well and i mean the band was just on fire like the the energy and the kind of i mean paul's sweating buckets in every gig that the amount you gave to those performances yeah the amount you gave to those performances as a band Mm. was incredible Mm. yeah it was look bloody exhausting well it would be now (laughs) <laughs> but, but Paul, and also Paul was back with a, you know, he was the, the song, the quality of the output, the quality of the songs he was writing mm. for that first mm. solo album, Wildwood, Stanley Road. It mm. was just incredible, wasn't it? It was. It was um, the longer it was together, the, the quicker we actually learned things. You know, you get that almost osmosis thing going on, you know, it's mm. like sort of, we did learn a lot very quickly, you know, mm. sometimes very quickly. Well, let me ask you about a couple of those periods. So, I mean, so many people have talked, like so many of the fans have talked about when we talk about this podcast and what, you know, the guests that have been on and stuff, talk about this being their favorite Weller lineup of all. So like total, really? the jam style. Concert. So, you know, they talk about Steve White, they talk about Yolanda Charles. I did not Charles. know that. 
Yeah, they talk about Craddock because obviously Steve Craddock and Brent, even Brendan Lynch on the knobs at this point. I don't know what he was doing at that point, but he was often on the stage filling with things and whatever. Providing wonderful sounds, actually. Well, instruments as well, like the Hammond sound, which was really good. And you were going all over the place, right? So again, Paul's tra- traveling the world again. It's not just UK. Yes, we were off again. Do you like that? Do you like the touring element of it? Do you like the, the kind of tour bus and all that? I think I feel mixed about that, really. I enjoyed a lot of it. I mean, it was always interesting going somewhere else. I think on the whole I enjoyed it, but Paul was never one for for doing mad long tours. That never happened. I think the longest really was maybe a month. I don't think there were many of those. You know, it was never like, it was no Fleetwood Mac kind of situation. I mean, it was, (laughs) you know, up to a point, you know, hotels are very nice. We had some marvellous times, but it's nice to get home. Let me ask you about some of these characters that are involved as well. So people like, um, I think John Weller got mentioned earlier on, but let's talk about John Weller. Obviously such a key part in Paul's career from day one, from the Jam, the Style Council and, and Solo. What are your memories of John? Oh, blimey. Oh, lots of memories of John. He was great. He looked after us, really, I would say. Well, he was good company. It was interesting. Andy Cross was talking on the podcast about how touring now has changed so much in the sense that when bands are on the tour bus, everybody's got their own mobile phone. Everybody's got, you know, kind of after a gig, everybody kind of goes and does their own thing. They're watching something, listening to something, headphones on or whatever. But back then you didn't really have all that technology. So aside from carry on films, which I gather were pretty popular on the tour bus, uh, (laughs) you're all together, aren't you? Ironic, ironic. (laughs) And on the buses and things like that. There aren't those distractions. So you are kind of forming bonds in a different way, I think, to maybe how people do touring these days. Yeah, there is that. I mean, um, what you could do, of course, is um, listen to your CDs and things. I said before that, you know, a bus has several compartments, really. You know, you've got the card club, which would be John and Kenny. <laughs> I was not in the card club. Then there'd be the, uh, the jazz club somewhere else, all listening to their own jazz things. And, you know, it was like that. I, I tended to go to the front and stick my feet over the front and go to sleep quite often. <laughs> Yeah, phones made a difference, haven't they? And were there songs, because you played on Stanley Road as well, which was this, I mean, mm. I don't know how many it's sold now, but at the time, like 1.5 million. And actually, not just keys, you play strings on things like Out of the Sinking and um, and Time Passes. And then we had Well, Paul's End as well. And You Do Something to Me, Paul's biggest selling record, I think, of all time. Played keys on that organ on that. Talk to me about the Stanley Road experience and the making of that album and being involved there. Yeah, it was at, um, oh, what do they call it? The Manor, wasn't it? Paul and some others were were staying there. I'd just turn up there when needed, basically. So, oh, yeah, sometimes it was good. The food was great. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It sounded like that. I mean, that that seemed like a very special place in terms of as as a studio. It was an amazing place. And again, I was surprised it closed, actually. But then the whole nature of recording has changed, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, so much so. So it was completely unrecognisable. Even the industry is completely unrecognisable from, Mm. what is that, 30 years ago, isn't it? It's like, you know, it's completely how we consume music, let alone anything else. And being part of the band at that time, did it feel like it was actually we're building something, Paul's coming back on top? I think it was already, you know, kind of back on top before Stanley Road, really. You know, it was, you know, the next the next album. There were a few times around that period where he links up again with Mick. I don't know if Mick ever played live with you as a band in that time or whether it was just on No, he up. didn't. But we, we did all meet um, one day, I think at Nomas or something, and we went through, we did learn two or three songs and both Mick and I were playing. But anyway, that didn't happen. I think Steve Winwood did those parts instead. Oh, <laughs> what? I didn't know this. It's all right. I bet Mick was fury. I mean, that's not a bad replacement, to be fair, is it? (laughs) No, no, couldn't really complain. So your time with the Weller Band, when did that come to an end? Yeah, that came to an end in, um, oh, when was it? Early 96, I think, or five, I can't remember. Yeah, he just wanted to slim the band down, I suppose, do more himself, possibly, and, you know, see how it went on. And it's interesting because he hasn't always had keys in... The lineups, he's not always, and then other times he's adding full orchestras. Well, and he's not a bad you know. player himself. So, when you look back on that time, then, so I'm trying to think, I'm trying to, trying to do the maths quickly in terms of that length of time that it would have been, but you were talking about around 10 years of your life. What kind of stands out for you as the, the, the biggest memories? Would it, would it be things like Live Aid in Glastonbury or smaller things? With the big things, definitely the first Glastonbury when it pulled down. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, with the mud man and everything. Were you all wearing the white Levi's at that point as well, right? In the, in we the mud. We were all wearing white Levi's. And um, the guy, I forgot the guy whose who was bus it was, was driving it, but he was ne- nearly up and plets it because we just kept going back on. <laughs> we were just completely covered. Him. In fact, we got there and the, um, the crew all have bin liners tied above the knee and we were carried everywhere. <laughs> It was um, like royalty. <laughs> yeah, except at the end when I forgot and jumped off the back of the stage somewhere and went straight up to my knees. It was quite a day that. So <laughs> don't forget that. And then of course Live Aid. And then I think I think Glastonbury in ninety four, I think, was probably one of the best gigs we've ever done in, in one place. It was almost perfect, really, and the way you know that it would in cosmos as the sun was going down, and it really was something that it's some of the bits of that where I can't what song you're playing, but it might be cosmos, but like, there's this like hazy sunshine, yeah, yeah. And, and there's like steam coming off the stage because it's yeah, it's yeah. Just beautiful, it's brilliant. It yeah. was, it was, it couldn't have been a better day or evening or the way it became evening. It was, it was magical, really. As for other things, yes, I mean, how long have you got? You know, <laughs> Well, we've got as long as you have. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, lots and lots of um, things to do with people and funny things and all sorts of stuff, the old drama every now and again, and, you know, lots of memories. Were there quite a lot of pranks played on? Because the jam used to play, like, um, do little tricks on each other, or other bands who were supporting and, like, sellotape their clothes to the ceiling and things like that. Did you? Were there practical jokes on tour with the Style Council? Um, no, the, well, the only one I remember is being stranded that time, walls come tumbling down. But, you know, that, that is etched. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I'm sure there were. I mean, there was plenty of humour. There were a lot of laughs. How did you feel when you watched back the Style Council documentary and you saw the story of the Style Council and then we had that performance from the four of them at the end? Yeah, yeah. It's a very deep sea. Was mm-hmm. that something you watched and sat through? Yes, because you might have missed it. I was in it. <laughs> <laughs> did, do you know what? I did wonder. I was like, she must have been. But... <laughs> no, I, I, I said a couple of sentences, I think. I had two spots, but I remember going to actually do it, be interviewed for it. And it was great, actually. Steve Sedanik was just leaving, but he stayed behind um, for my little stint. I enjoyed it. I thought it was very good. And I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, there were, there were things I, you know, whether it was the mechanics of how it all got done or other things, um, there were things I wasn't aware of. I don't mean bad things, just stuff, you know, during the time I, I was in Style Council that was interesting to to hear about, you know, attitude to how the record was put together, the Red Wedge thing, but, you know, some nuanced um, differences of opinion as to as to what people thought of it. And all the rest of it, so, yeah, I thought it was really great. Now, let's talk post Paul Weller solo. You've been up to lots of music since then. It's not like you've left the Weller band and that was it, right? Well, I, no, I wouldn't say there was a vast amount that I've, I've been doing, but I've done various bits and pieces, not really on a, a kind of strictly professional kind of thing. Oh, no, some of it was. I worked with uh, Frances Raphael on quite a lot of things. She was the, the West End star and all the rest of it. And we did a pretty good album, actually, with Gary Kemp, where we took show tunes even though I hate them mostly <laughs> deconstructed them <laughs> and then and then we'd do them like kind of small and so actually it was really good it really worked I enjoyed doing that there was a project I came across online which is called Aliens oh yeah yeah which is I mean it's described as a music film and animation collective so this is the guitarist out Delamitri Ian Harvey, Harvey, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and Tim May, the filmmaker. And then there's That's like right. musicians and photographers and all kind of people. Yeah, involved, so. uh, Martin Barker, drummer, and, you know, with all sorts of people. And, and me. Yeah, it was really interesting. I haven't really done anything with that for a couple of years now. You know, it was good. You know, really some interesting songs, great musicians, pretty heavy, actually, at the time. You know, it was like sort of nice and rocky. <laughs> well, that was the thing about that, that the um, that Weller solo band at that point as well. It was pretty loud. Those gigs were pretty loud. It was full on, wasn't it? Those those Weller solo years. Yes, it could be pretty loud. <laughs> it was very loud sometimes on stage. But occasionally there'd have to be a, a level amnesty. 
everybody bring it down. Uh, when we first spoke, and this was ages ago now, you were um, at that time you were preparing for something at the, um, I think it was the Froome Folk Festival, or Froome Music uh, No, it wasn't Folk Festival. Was it? It, Froome has a, it has a festival every summer. There's a lot of theatre goes on there. A lot of, a lot of things, you know, talks, it's, it's pretty well known. But no, I just got involved in um, rehearsals for one of the plays they were doing called The Haunting of Richard III, the musical. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> anyway, because the guy who wrote this stuff wasn't around, I, I came and um, there wasn't really any music either, so I had to kind of learn a load of songs. It was interesting. After all the lockdown and everything, it kind of um, got me going again, really use your brain type thing and you know who knows i'm sure i'll do something else at some point the other thing i did was um my husband plays double bass it was never his career but he's pretty good on the doing 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 so we did a bit of swing jazz for a bit and that was interesting we do that from time to time so you've still got that kind of musical bug it's still in there I have to play every now and again not necessarily in front of every, anyone but I have to play if I go two or three days without actually doing anything I get to feel a bit odd really but as I say God, I'm going to have to just playing balls come tumbling down and one or two others and think I've really got to get my fingers going and, and relearn them because at the moment it's terrible. I remember listening to Paul Weller on, um, it was Master Tapes on Radio 4 with John Wilson. Oh, and John it, Wilson, yeah. Oh, John Wilson, lovely. And they, it was, they, they were talking about the gift. Paul played a bit of Five O'Clock Hero, the jam, and got like a, a maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds in and realised that he couldn't quite play. His fingers were, it was like, this is a, these are young man's chords. <laughs> and I guess yeah. it's a similar thing that you're talking about, right? It's like the nimble if, if, fingers. If you're a classical player or even a jazzer, then you could probably practice pretty hard every day, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it goes. Yeah, it's that match the, fitness, the, I suppose. Simple as that, really. Yeah, it is match fitness. And I mean, you know, there's no doubt that when you are involved pretty well full time with, with music and you're on tour and all the rest of it, you really do get pretty nimble and stronger. Mm. And from talking to Yolanda, it sounds like Paul's a pretty demanding band leader as well. He has like pretty high expectations of how people are playing and the amount of effort people put in and all that kind of stuff as well. Energy. Yes. He did. I think he always did with Star Council. I mean, you know, when you think, how old was he? 26, 27? You know, he had pretty good grasp of how to have a rehearsal and when to do when. I mean, it was, you know, it wasn't just turning up and um, drinking coffee all day. Yeah, Matt Dyson said that, actually. He said the rehearsals when he was in the Weller solo band, but the rehearsals were like a full gig. Quite often, yeah, depending on how far you were along. And how long you hadn't played for together, maybe, or whatever, yeah. Well, funnily enough, that didn't, you know, you could often not play for a couple of months and often you'd be completely brilliant on day one. <laughs> then it would fall apart after that and have to start again. <laughs> but um, a lot of things got worked out live as well, you know, on the way. So And those yeah. and those songs evolve in a live setting as well, don't they? I think something like Foot of the Mountain. I think like, they like, often do. Yeah. Probably goes for many bands doesn't it a kind of sound check idea and those elements where uh, like at glastonbury that glastonbury 94 where foot of the mountain just turns into a massive jam it was mighty that wasn't it <laughs> i think it's the heaviest thing we've ever done yeah <laughs> or at least when i was there i'd have been like i don't know where he's going what's he doing he's gone up but but you all had that confidence as a band to kind of just follow each other and riff yeah. off each other didn't you that's what i was talking about before you you kind of knew thankfully <laughs> you know, I mean, all I'd say is that there are some wonderful moments, great people. Does it feel like that all went, was like A, another lifetime ago, B, just flew by in an incredibly ridiculously fast time? It's a strange thing, time, isn't it? That's never been said before, but it is. I can't believe it's so long ago. I can't even believe that it's, it's you know, nearly 30 years since the I was involved in the solo thing, let alone the style council. And yet, you know, a lot of it does seem like yesterday. It's like elastic, isn't it? Because it's also the style council really is such a short period. It's out of the jam. You know, the, these bands are such short periods of time, really. But you think the legacy that they've left in the music that still stands up these days that people, you know, people absolutely love these ch tunes. Don't they? Well, as I, as I said, I mean, just I, I think, because uh, remember, the, I said on the Sky thing, there was all that, goaded rivalry between Wham and, you know, Star Wars. There wasn't any contest. 
They were completely different things. You know, I'm sorry, but as far as I remember, most of the people playing with one were kind of session blokes, basically, and which, nothing wrong with that. But, I mean, Paul put a, a band together with women and very young people, very talented, but very young people. You know, it's amazing the amount of faith he put in that, you know, a 16-year-old drummer, 17-year-old drummers. And there was such a great bunch as well. I should ask you before you go, actually, one thing I didn't ask was about Steve White. So, obviously, the connection between the Style Council and Paul Solo. I mean, Kamel's there for bits, but but Steve White, really the bedrock of that band mm. for so long with Paul. You know, I mean, you're still pals with Steve, obviously. Oh, we're very, very good pals, yeah. I mean, such a talent, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, he just is. He, he must be one of the best drummers in this country, if if not, you know. It was funny at the um, at the Brighton exhibition. I should tell you this at the Brighton exhibition. We watched the documentary together, right? So the audience mm-hmm. watched the documentary, and I was sat between Mick and Steve. Oh, yeah. so Steve spent the entire time, like every song that came on, he'd be tapping his knees. Jiggling his feet, play, it was like he was like almost oh. virtually playing the drums to all the songs. It was—I don't know if he even knew he was doing it. It was really funny. <laughs> the problem with drummers, isn't they? They just Con- never stop playing. Yeah, constantly fitting with anything. <laughs> with anything. I know. I used to say I love Steve very much, but even his practice pad sounds up. I don't want to be in a bedroom anywhere near him. <laughs> and no, exaggerating slightly. But. <laughs> oh, Helen, this has been so lovely digging into some oh, of these memories been, with been you. Fun. Um, I mean, these are such key periods for me as a fan, loving that yeah. early solo career and stuff, and then digging into the back castle of the style counts, which I know means so much to so many people as well. So thank you for that. I have two final questions for you before you go, okay? <laughs> these are the same questions everybody gets on the podcast. So right. you are, you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life it can be the jam the style council or solo what are you going to go with oh god <laughs> for a minute there I thought the zoom thing might have frozen <laughs> that was the longest pause we've ever had I'm, I'm sorry just give me a minute um oh god I mean there are three or four that Give me the list of what you're going, what's going through your head. Um, I think from, I loved Have You Ever Had It Blue, you know, which was really quite jazzy. I, I was just in awe of the arrangement and the way Paul sang it and everything everyone was doing. So that's one sort of thing. And um, I also loved a B-side, which I asked if we could play a few times in the solo thing, which was called Call Me. Do you know? It was on, what was it called? The collection. It was like a it was like a Style Council B-Sides album. I can't remember it's called now, but it's on that, yeah. It's on the, one of the 12 inches I've got here. I can't think which one off the top of my head. Yeah, it, I thought it was quite beautiful, actually. Yes, yeah. But there are lots. I, I mean, there were loads. I mean, long hots, you know. Where do you start? <laughs> um, what would you be picking from the solo the, years? What's going the through solo your years, well couple of obvious ones you do something and wildwood itself and what were those mick talbot ones that he was stitching you up on then so what were the ones that he'd what were the hard ones that he's handing over <laughs> i don't think that's the oh, blimey i think he had the more complicated bits i mean it was probably doing things like uh, learning string parts or brass parts and think you know <laughs> <laughs> all that sort of stuff. I love all those mixed all. I mean, it's not really the question because we're talking about Paul Weller songs, but I love all the mixed all, but it's the little ditties, the mixed company, mix up, all those things are oh, so mix catchy. Up. I know. Well, so I was, catchy. Oh, that's another one. I didn't even realise I saw a thing on, on YouTube of that for the first time last week. And I just looked at it and thought, oh, this is great. And then I thought, can't do that either. <laughs> 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 well, the thing is, Helen, what you have to bear in mind is that at least you could once, whereas I've never been able to do that. So, you know. <laughs> right, I'm going to nail you down to one song, though. Come on, which one would it be? If you, if you, At the end of this conversation, if you had to put one on the radio, what would it be? Actually, another one, My Ever-Changing Moods. What was that like to play live? I'm trying to think what I played on it. Did you play that live in the solo years as well, or was it just... Yeah, we did. Yeah, I did mix part on the, on the piano then. I think that's all I did on that, I think. Oh, I'll tell you what, just because it's so beautiful, just play Wildwood. 
Yes, 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 yes. Never get tired of hearing that. It's beautiful. No. Never get tired. Um, now, final question. So the purpose of this podcast is not least to talk to amazing people like yourself, Helen, who've got these memories, these stories, these connections with Paul from playing in his bands and all that. But it's also for me to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed during my radio career. It was my one big regret, never getting to interview the man. So I've created a podcast to make it happen. If I get to interview Paul at the end of this podcast series, what should I ask him? <laughs> What's he up to? What's he up to? That's a joke. That was a joke. I know he's doing loads of stuff. Yeah, what's he been up to since? <laughs> what's he been up to? That's a joke. <laughs> hey, look, this has been so lovely. I've loved digging into these stories, <laughs> these memories with you. It's been fabulous. And thank you again for the music, I have to say, as a fan. But Helen Turner, thank you for joining me. Not at all. Thank you, Dan. Well, that was lovely. My thanks once again to Helen Turner for joining me on the podcast. As I say, another guest who was on that wish list from day one. So lovely to have her on and to hear her story. Head to my website for more information. It's paulwellerfanpodcast.com. There are the show notes there, but also a playlist of music that I've created featuring Helen on the there as well. Now, whilst you're there, you can show your support by heading to my store. We've got exclusive merchandise, our first official podcast mug, and you can also buy a virtual coffee as well on the roll call this week. Hello to Craig, aka Gleese, says, Hi Dan, brilliant as always. They make my journey to work so much better. Keep the faith, Craig. Hello to Steve Henson, loving the podcast, Dan. Keep up the good work. As a wise man once sang, I'm content just with the riches that you bring. John Reed, bore you a coffee. Thank you, John. Hello to Martin Bonhom, Mike C, Richard Jones Nerzik, Simon Castledge, Alex McLaughlin says the Foxy Fowler episode is one of the best. There's no way I can narrow 124 episodes down to a top five, but I suspect this one would be in it if I did. Martin Glover, thanks for your donation. Ian Jackson says dig in the old breed. Steve Perry, thank you to you as well. Cheers for all your virtual coffees. You can get involved on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. On the next episode of the podcast, our final one of the year, folks, I am joined by an absolute legend, the multi-award winning music photographer, Jill Fermanovsky. Make sure you follow, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts on Apple, Spotify. You'll find me on social media as well. Get in touch on Twitter at WellerFanPod or on Instagram or Facebook, Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.